Hello everyone, I'm Terry Owens with the District Department of Transportation, better known as DDOT, and welcome to DDOT Delivers. Each week we take you inside one of the district's largest government agencies for a look at what we're doing to serve residents and visitors of the District of Columbia. Today we have a very special guest, Kim Lucas is manager of the Sustainable Transportation Branch, which includes our Capital Bike Share program. Kim, welcome to the show. Hi, Terry. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. We are delighted to have you. Kim, for people not familiar with the Capital Bike Share system, and I don't know who that would be, but tell us why this program is one that district residents should be proud of. Well, that's because Capital Bike Share is the program of district residents. It is a municipal, publicly owned bike share system, and it's one of the oldest in the country. There are 290 Capital Bike Share stations in DC today, and we expect that that number will be greater than 300 later this year. There are 4,000 bikes that are available at the fingertips of district residents and visitors, both within the District of Columbia and in our neighboring jurisdictions of Virginia and Maryland. It's one of the most affordable and fast fastest ways to get around this region. So this is a regional program. Talk about the significance of that and how our residents benefit as a result. Capital Bike Share is a fully interoperable system. So even though the bikes and stations within DC are owned by DC and the bikes and stations in Virginia and Maryland are owned by their respective member jurisdictions, the systems are fully interoperable. So one person, one Capital Bike Share member can have one Capital Bike Share key and they can access any one of those 4,500 plus bikes, DC, Virginia, or Maryland. They can pick up in one place and drop it off in another and it's fully seamless. You mentioned that DC was one of the early adopters for uh, bike sharing programs. Talk about how it's evolved over the years. Washington, D.C. was the first city in the United States to have a public bike sharing system. We started the trend in 2008 with Smart Bike D.C., which was the predecessor system to Capital Bike Share. On September 20th, 2010, Capital Bike Share hit the streets in Washington, D.C. and in neighboring Arlington County, Virginia, and we have grown. At that time in 2010, there were around 100 stations and 1,000 bikes. Today, there are over 500 stations in DC, Virginia, and Maryland, and over 4,000 bicycles. Capital Bike Share was joined in 2017, again on September 20th, we share a birthday, uh, by the introduction of dockless bikes and scooters. So private companies that are trying to expand the market of two-wheeled transportation options to our residents and visitors here in DC. Are you surprised that program's been so, uh, the Capital Bike Share system has been so popular in the district? Not at all. You know, as I mentioned before, biking is one of the fastest ways to get around DC, not to mention one of the most affordable. For $8 per month, you can take unlimited trips on Capital Bike Share. You could truly take a bike 1 million times or more, and for $8 a month, as long as those trips aren't longer than 30 minutes each trip, then you don't pay another penny. And again, with having almost 300 stations within the district, we're in all eight wards. So not only are we an affordable option, we're an accessible option. And when you combine those opportunities with the, the health benefits of burning some calories and, and the mental health benefits of getting some fresh air, there's almost no better way to get around. And we've hit some pretty substantial milestones in terms of ridership, right? Absolutely. On those 4,000 bikes, we have seen nearly 23 million trips on Capital Bike Wait, I don't think they heard you, Kim. Can you say that again just in case somebody might have missed that? We have seen nearly 23 million trips on Capital Bike Share bikes since we launched in 2010. Wow. That's incredible. Absolutely. And so not only is it affordable and we have all of those health benefits for the individual, but we've also seen success in improving the congestion in our city. There have been research studies that have shown that in Washington, D.C., where we have the presence of capital bike share stations, there has been a reduction in the amount of automobile congestion by 4%. So not only is it a benefit to the individuals who are saving money and getting around town quickly and healthfully, it's also improved 
improving the experience for other users of our roadway. And you can't miss them. They're the distinctive red bikes uh, powered by, or your, your bikes, your stations are solar powered? 100%. Every single one of those stations is fully solar powered. The bikes themselves are human powered. And so not only do we have great health benefits for the users, but in terms of environmental air quality, we're, we're doing a great job there as well. Now, how do you guys decide where to locate these bike stations? Data. Data, 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 and public input. So when we're trying to figure out a place to put a bike share station, we wanna make sure that it'll be successful. And what does that mean? That means we wanna put it where near people live. We wanna put it near where people work. And we wanna put it near other forms of transportation because we know that someone could take a capital bike share bike to get from their house to their office, or they could take that bike to get from their house to the metro station or to a bus stop. And we have proof that a large percentage of our users do that. So when we're placing stations, we wanna make sure that they're accessible to the places that people are and the places that people wanna go. In addition to that, we wanna make sure that we are equitable in the distribution of our resources. And so we not only look at the high density locations and the high population areas, but we also have included public health Health variables as well as income variables to make sure that all neighborhoods have a chance for capital bike share in the district. Say more about that because there are a lot of residents who <clears throat> uh, look at the program and question the affordability of it and uh, there used to be an issue around credit card use and that sort of thing. You've taken steps to try and address all of those things, right? We have. So capital bike share from a geographic perce perception, perspective rather, has been in all eight wards of the district since we launched in 2010. However, uh, through member surveys, we found that not all, you, all persons in the district felt that they had an equal opportunity to use Capital Bike Share. You mentioned that to use Capital Bike Share, you generally need a credit card on file. Um, we identified some other, other barriers as well. And so a couple of years ago, we launched what we call our Community Partners Program. That is a program that works with local nonprofits, so organizations that are providing affordable health care options. Most recently, we announced a partnership with our Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs to connect low-income individuals in the district with an affordable bike share membership. And so as opposed to the, the typical annual cost of a capital bike share membership, which is $85 a year, members in our Community Partners Program are able to sign up for the low cost of $5 a year. In addition, I mentioned earlier that your Capital Bike Share membership includes unlimited trips up to 30 minutes in duration. Well, for those individuals as part of the Community Partners Program, we've doubled that included ride time. So they, they enjoy 60 minute trips as part of their memberships. To date, we've seen over a thousand individuals that have benefited from that program and it's continuing to grow rapidly. Now you guys recently uh, launched a pilot to include e-bikes in the system and just recently you expanded that number of e-bikes available. Uh, talk about uh, what you guys learned through the pilot and why you wanted to expand the number of e-bikes on the street. Definitely. So we uh, have launched what we call our Cabby Plus program. And so today on the streets, you can find one of 80 Capital Bike Share Plus e-bike bikes available. The benefit of e-bikes is that they make it easier to go. So if you're going uphill, if you're going long distances, or if you perhaps don't have the fitness that you feel you need to have to ride a bike, e-bikes break down that barrier and give individuals the opportunity to, to take a two-wheel trip and to go farther and to go faster. We plan to expand that program, as you mentioned, Terry. So today there are about 80 bikes on the street that have that electric assist, and we plan to expand that dramatically fivefold by the end of spring. Fantastic, and that is uh, something that I know people are excited about because uh, as they trucked around the district looking for those e-bikes during the pilot program, they were like, I can't find one. Uh, how, how do you make sure these things stay charged, though? I guess that was one of the questions we heard. Yeah, so that is one of the, the challenges. The more high tech a bike gets, the more components there are that you have to maintain. And with Capital Bike Share, we have a very robust and diligent maintenance program to make sure that all of our bikes that are available for rent are in proper working condition. So the bikes themselves, they have a battery monitor on them. And when they get to a certain level of low battery, the system knows to lock that bike in place so that it cannot be rented. 
that gives our contractor the opportunity to go out, find the bike, switch the battery, and make it make sure that it's good and reliable for the next person who wants to rent it. All right, you're listening to DDOT Delivers. I'm Terry Owens. Our guest today is Kim Lucas. She is a manager in the Sustainable Transportation Branch, and today she's got on her Capital Bike Share hat. Uh, we will take a break and come back and continue this conversation in just a moment. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to DDOT Delivers. I'm Terry Owens, uh, where we get you up to speed on everything going on at the district's Department of Transportation. Today, we're talking with Kim Lucas. She's the manager of Sustainable Transportation Branch at DDOT. And today, we're talking about the Capital Bike Share System. Kim, during our first block, you touched on uh, the Dockless program and how it has expanded the options for people who want to uh, traverse the district on either bike or scooter. Talk about the decision-making, the thinking that went into introducing this concept in the district. The district has an interest in making sure that anybody who lives here, anybody who comes to visit is able to get around. We have a focus on improving mobility and with a growing population, we need to find new ways to move an increasing number of individuals without necessarily increasing the number of cars on our streets. More cars means more congestion and more air pollution. And so at DDOT, we're very invested in, and Mayor Bowser's administration very invested in making sure people have options to get around the city in ways that are good for them and good for the city. And so Capital Bike Share, as we mentioned, was one of the first bike sharing programs in the United States and hugely successful and is hugely successful today. But we were approached in 2017 by new companies and new technologies that really thought DC would be a great place for them to launch their businesses. And since we had an interest in improving mobility and options and giving people chances for two-wheeled mobility, um, we decided to launch a pilot at that time to make sure that these new technologies would have the opportunity to be tested in DC, but in a controlled way to make sure that if there were any negative um, results of these new technologies that we'd be able to manage the situation so that we could maintain a safe and, and well-functioning public space. And community engagement was an important part of this process for us. We were out in the community talking to people. Talk about why that was important. Well, we knew that as soon as dockless bikes or dockless scooters hit the streets that they would be noticed, that there would be a lot of them, that there would be the possibility that they would um, cause a lot of questions from members of the public. So before we launched the program, we held town halls and we held or we made available um, different ways to engage with the district via email or via phone so that we could get the input from the general public because we knew that there were a lot of people that were supporting of the programs, but we also wanted to make sure that we were fully aware of what potential challenges or concerns that there were with the district residents with these new technologies because they were new and there was a lot of news throughout the U.S. of these new programs hitting the streets and DC wanted to maintain its position as a leader in new mobility and that was an opportunity to make sure that we were doing it with everybody on board. And a year later the program has taken off in so many different ways. Uh, it's evolved from a program that was solely focused around dockless bikes to now the dockless scooters and I hear there's even more technology down the road. Were you surprised at how it Huge, hugely <laughs> surprised. You know, I still remember the first day that one of the now, um, I guess one of our older scooter companies came to DDOT and said, hey, we think we want to we wanna put scooters on your streets. And I all but laughed. I was like, <laughs> scooters, come on, what's that about? Uh, fortunately, I was able to travel to some international cities, including Tel Aviv, that has had a very large scooter tra really? for transportation um, sort of economy. And so I was able to view, you know, when I was on vacation one time, that these are tools for transportation. And so, and once we made that opportunity available and, and allowed those scooters through our permit program to operate on our streets, we've seen how successful they are for people who want to get around on two wheels, but maybe don't want to get sweaty. The mm -hmm. scooter makes it easier for them, or maybe they don't know how to ride a bike. Um, and the big factor that I think is why they're so successful is that they're fun. 
You know, that's one of the great things about my job is that I care deeply about transportation and making the city work well and improving the environment. And I also get to do that by promoting things that are fun and that you see people smiling when they're riding a bike or they're riding a scooter. So they've been wildly successful. I've even scooted for transportation. You know, I use all modes. Um, And so I think we are continuing to to see that program grow and we're continuing to see the benefits of it and we're working hard to make sure that if there are any challenges with it that we're working to address them. Well, one of the smart things uh, that uh, we did was to manage the growth of these programs as opposed to just letting the companies come in and drop as many vehicles as they wanted and operate uh, sort of willy-nilly. Why, why was it important to have some structure around this thing? So DDOT is full of very smart people, I'd like to think. And and Mayor Bowser's administration is full of very smart people. And so prior to the technologies, the dockless bikes and the dockless scooters launching in DC, we knew that they were launching in other cities internationally. And so we looked to those examples and we talked with those cities and we saw especially some international examples where they were having problems with unlimited uh, numbers of bikes on their street, which resulted in lots of piles of, of bikes that weren't being used. Um, and we wanted to, to mitigate those risks in advance. And so we knew that if we gave, you know, a significant number of bikes and scooters per company, we started with 400, we're now at 600 per company, enough to let them experiment and to get feedback from the general public, but without just opening the floodgates, that it was an opportunity to learn and to experiment, but without seeing some of the negative problems that we saw in other cities that had similar programs. Okay, and there have been some challenges, as you might expect with anything new. How are we addressing the challenges in advancing these programs? Education. So with the 2019 dockless vehicle application for those companies that are operating in D.C. today, we had a strong element to that application that said, show us your education. So show us how you will incentivize your users to act not only lawfully, but respectfully. One of the challenges we have is as you introduce new technologies like scooters to sidewalks where they are legally allowed to be ridden everywhere on sidewalks except for within the central business district is educating folks, A, where they're allowed to be ridden on sidewalks, and B, if you are riding on a sidewalk, what does right look like? You know, making sure you're you're doing it in a, a slow enough speed so that you're not causing issues for those that are also using the sidewalk, making sure that when you end your trip, you're leaving it in places that will not impede access to the sidewalk for other users, especially those who might have mobility challenges and use a wheelchair or some other mobility device. And so through different uh, marketing campaigns that the district is working on or through encouraging the vendors to educate their users directly through the app and through other materials, we're just working to improve not only the education of the customers, but also education of the other users of the public space so that they know what right looks like and what to do if they see wrong. And we want to include equity in everything that we do. Is there a component that allows this program to be affordable for anybody that wants to use it? Yes. So there was a requirement with the 2019 application and and to be able to operate under our permit this year, there was an affordability requirement that provided a certain number of free or reduced cost memberships to the different dockless programs for individuals who qualified based on their income levels. So we made sure that not only from an affordability perspective, but also from an accessibility perspective by requiring each of these companies to have a certain number of their bikes or scooters in each of the eight wards every single morning, that the program could be available to anybody who wanted to try it. Okay, you are listening to DDOT Delivers on 96.3 HD4 and dcradio.gov. I'm Terry Owens. Our guest uh, today is Kim Lucas. She is the manager of the Sustainable Transportation Branch for the District Department of Transportation, and we are talking all things bike share and dockless and anything you want to know about bikes. We, we're we going to take a quick break and we'll come back in just a moment. And welcome back everybody. You're listening to DDOT Delivers on WHUR 96.3 HD4. I'm Terry Owens. Our guest today is Kim Lucas. She is manager of the Sustainable Transportation Branch at the District Department of Transportation. Kim, one of the things we do on this show every week is we ask our guests 
to drop the veil and tell them <laughs> a little bit about themselves and how they got to where they are today. Uh, we look at these transportation jobs and uh, a lot of people uh, might be interested in careers in this area and don't have a clue where to begin. I mean, tell us a little about your journey. Absolutely. So I have been in transportation, professional transportation, my entire career. And it all began when I decided to become a bus driver when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Virginia. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> You're in college, going along, and you decide, I'm going to go drive a bus. I well, How at the <laughs> at UVA, it was a really popular student job. So I was oh, really? looking around, and I was looking for a part time job. And I knew some bus drivers; they had, you know, <laughs> great parties, Terry. <laughs> and uh, that led to me getting a commercial driver's license at 18 years of age. Wow! And so we were driving 40 foot long transit vehicles. Um, you know, the 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 routes that went through the university's grounds. I ultimately became a trainer, so I actually taught other people how to drive buses. I'm still shocked that they let, you know, <laughs> young college students operate these multiple hundred thousand dollar state owned vehicles, but it was a blast. And that was my first exposure to transportation and specifically transportation operations. Prior to that time, you know, I'd been just a typical college student, I'd be so upset waiting for the bus. Man, the bus is always late, and by the time it gets here, it's full, and I can never get on, and uh, what is wrong with these buses? And then I got to see the other side of the table. When I became a bus driver, I all of a sudden had the aha, oh, it's always full because everybody's on the same schedule. Mm. Everybody's going to class, and they all start at the same time. And <laughs> that's why we're behind schedules, because we're picking up everybody. And so it was a really good lesson in perspective and how that can change. And so I studied art history and psychology and knew I didn't really want to do either of those professionally. So mm -hmm. I was really excited when I was recruited to manage a bus stop program for Arlington County, Virginia. Yeah. So that was my first job out of college. You know, someone saw that bus driving experience on some recruitment website and called me in. Didn't think it'd be something I'd be that interested in. Um, went to the interview for interview experience, but thought, wow, bus stops. So I can make differences to the public space. I can make changes and, and, and have some some effort and impact on that. I can improve the access to public transportation for people, and especially people with disabilities who maybe couldn't use the bus stop before I put a pad down. And I can help improve the environment. Okay, sold. So I went and I did that for a few years and decided, wow, I really love this. You know, the only thing I knew when I graduated college was that whatever job I was going to get, I needed to be able to do it with a clean conscience. Hmm. I needed to be able to sleep at night. And I've always wanted to save the world. And who knew that transportation planning was the way to do that? So I, I decided to go to grad school and got my master's degree in city planning with a transportation concentration. You know, did a lot of research in alternative fuels and in transit um, and in bicycle and pedestrian work. And was fortunate enough to eventually find my way back to the DC region and have been with DDOT for six years this month. First as a bicycle program specialist where I managed Capital Bike Share for a number of years and then now as the manager of the sustainable transportation branch. And what all does that entail? I, people have no idea what the sustainable transportation branch is. We were talking about uh, one of your new hires on the way over here. Yeah, so the Sustainable Transportation Branch is a spin-off from the Active Transportation Branch. We're a relatively new group, but we include the Capital Bike Share and Dockless Vehicle Programs. We include Transportation Demand Management, which for folks out there in Radio Land, if they've heard of the Go DC Go brand, mm -hmm. our website where we are able to educate and help inform on good transportation choices. Um, and it also includes freight and urban delivery. So. The population of the district is increasing and the amount of commerce that are resulting in delivery is increasing. And so more and more, there's more competition for the curbside space. And so our group looks at how we can better manage that space and how we can plan for the future. Wow. So you're in middle school, you're in high school. Do you have any idea that this is where you'd wind up? 
Absolutely not. <laughs> no. Um, as a teenager growing up in the D.C. region and taking the bus to the metro and the metro into D.C. by myself and having my great aunts and grandmothers tell me about how they used to ride the streetcar in D.C. when they were kids, you know, transportation has always been something that's been really critical and public transportation is something that I've always believed in. You know, I care and that's why and I'm in the job I'm in and why a lot of people work for DDOT is because we care. We care about about improving the public space. We care about improving the quality of life for residents and visitors by giving them great transportation options. And we care about improving the environment by encouraging the use of options that don't increase air pollution and have a positive impact on public health like biking and walking. And so I'm really grateful to have the position I have and to help push the needle in the district to reach some of those shared goals. If I didn't know better, I think you enjoyed your job. I love my job, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> and not just the times that I get to be on the radio, but the the opportunity and the privilege to be able to come to work every day and to know that what you're doing is helping the greater good is is huge. And I'm, I'm glad I get to do it. So can you give us a sneak peek? Is there anything on the horizon that we should be looking out for from Capital Bike Share or the Sustainable Transportation Branch in general? Everything, you know, mobile um, dockless vehicles and, and micro mobility is huge and that program is continuing to grow. Capital Bike Share, as I said, we're at 290 stations in the district today and we'll be at over 300 later this year. We'll be vastly increasing the number of e-bikes that we make available through Capital Bike Share. And so I think what you can expect to see is more, more options to get around on two wheels more information about how to do that safely and efficiently and hopefully even better curbside use when it comes to the freight programs in the district and, and seeing improvements there along with increased demand. Mm -hmm. What's the best way for people to engage your programs? You know, if you have a request, something that I actually haven't even touched on today, but bike racks, our team also installs ah, bike rack racks. Attack. Yeah. So if you have a request to have bike parking in front of your building or your home or your office, you can call 311 and that will make it to the team. If you have questions or concerns about anything in the public space, you can call 311, whether it's a capital bike share issue or a dockless vehicle issue. We also, you can reach us on the capital bike share website, capitalbikeshare.com or through the GoDC Go website site where individuals can find great information about their transportation options here in the district. Well, Kim, as usual, you have been a wealth of information. Thank you so much for making some time for us. Thank you, Terry. Okay. You've been listening to DDOT Delivers. I'm Terry Owens. Our guest today, Kim Lucas. She's the manager of the Sustainable Transportation Branch. And you can find out more about us on ddot.dc.gov. That's all things uh, the District Department of Transportation. That's ddot.dc.gov. Uh, Capital Bike Share, the Go DC Go initiatives, everything is there. That's going to do it for us this week. Come back and check us out again. I'm Terry Owens. Have a great day, everybody.